Okay, so hi everyone. So let's start. Uh, thanks for joining and welcome to my talk, how to prevent your Kubernetes cluster from uh, being hacked. Um, yeah, so basically we would like, what I would like to talk to about today, a little bit about Kubernetes security and a tooling around it, um, what you can yeah, implement, what you can do to prevent your cluster from being hacked. Um, yeah, so who am I? Um, my name is Nico Meisenzahl, um, basically being consultant in the Kubernetes, um, cloud native, Azure, universal ecosystem. Um, I'm Microsoft MVP, GitLab Hero, um, basically yeah, doing things around helping our customers um, to get their applications running in the cloud in a cloud native way um, with Kubernetes. Yeah, um, so first of all, why do we need to talk about security or is it still needed to talk about security? So this is basically a screenshot from um, Red Hat's Kubernetes uh, security report from uh, last year. Um, and as you see, um, it looks like we have still some, um, some need to improve our security. Um, so based on the first measurement here, detected misconfigurations up to um, 53% of configuration issues related to security. Um, we had 38% of major vulnerabilities to remediate and um, even scary 30% security incidents during runtime. Um, so really something happened in runtime in productions, 30% answered, but yes, we had that one. Um, below, also really, really bad um, in the last 12 months, so basically 2021, um, 31% had any kind of customer lose, revenue lose due to security issues, um, which is for me a pretty, pretty high number. Um, so it looks like it's um, still a topic we need to talk about and to be honest, gets even worse. So we have here security incidents during runtime 30%. If we're now going to the report from this year, so basically the data from last year, we have 49% of security incidents in runtime. Um, so the numbers are even higher. Um, so still we need to invest um, all of us into our security and also with Kubernetes. So today's talk isn't really, uh, isn't about how to get into a Kubernetes cluster, how to inject, how to run workload in the cluster and so on. It's really more about preventing it. Um, if you would like to get more insights, how easy it can be to get access to a compromised cluster running workload and so on, um, check out my Hatchet Kubernetes talk. You'll find all the recordings on YouTube and, and GitHub or maybe it's a little bit late. Yesterday, uh, Bastian from SUSE uh, did a talk on that one. Maybe you joined that one. So um, this time it's really more about what you can do to prevent this and a little bit um, tooling around that. Yeah, um, so how to start um, thinking about the security? Um, for me, it's basically pretty easy. Um, I'm a big fan of starting small, iterate and implement security. So it doesn't mean you shouldn't think about security and start with a security project or something, but it doesn't help you to just start a project, project talking about, yeah, we would like to increase our security for two years and then starting implementing it after two years or so. So I'm a fan for going through the DevOps lifecycle, thinking about, okay, let's start with some smaller improvements, maybe just implementing them best practice, some um, low hanging fruits um, to increase and of course, all the time thinking about the overall goal and, and building up a project, but really iterating, implementing changes uh, one by one and really through the whole life cycle. Not only think about your running environment, also think about your code, um, yeah, steady code analysis and, and stuff like this. So in general, um, what do you need to think about? Um, first of all, rising awareness. Um, to make everyone aware, not only the SRE or the DevOps engineer, also software development, to really make sure that the application code itself is, is really secure. And then think about shifting left. So not introducing security at the end. So it's saying, okay, the application is ready, we need to go live tomorrow. Oh, maybe we should think about security. Um, and then slowing everything down, but really shifting left and really starting with security in mind when implementing, when we are building the architecture and so on. So really start on the left and uh, shift security left. Then of course, 
think about your application, think about your deployment code. When we're talking about Kubernetes, the Kubernetes manifest, there are many settings and perspectives here to, to higher security. Um, building the queue container images in general, um, this is something we will touch on today. Um, think about Kubernetes policies. Um, on the one side, what you allow to run in your cluster. On the other side, also network securities um, to really make sure that traffic is only routed um, yeah, to instances or application you would like to have them routed, and many, many more. But this is, let's say, common things, and we, things and we find details on, on the internet everywhere. Um, I would like to focus today on three specific tools, um, which are a little bit newer, let's say like this. Um, first off, we would, would like to show you Wolfi or Wolfi OS from uh, Changard and show you how you can build secure and clean uh, container images with that one. And then we will talk about um, yeah, container image verification and how you can use cosine and tools like this in Caverno to make sure that really just the container you just built and signed is um, yeah, really running on your environment. And last but not least, we're talking a little bit about container runtime security. And I will show you how you can really prevent in the runtime when you're yeah, getting an, an security incidents and so on, seeing that in your cluster and also preventing it with, um, with uh, Tetragon from, from Zilium. So these are basically the three main parts we will talk about today. Yeah, so starting with Wolfi. Um, so Wolfie, as I said, is an open source uh, tool uh, mainly um, developed by Jenga at the moment. Um, they basically, from their website, saying we are the first Linux undistro uh, designed for securing the software supply chain. Um, so what the hell is undistro? Um, basically, it's distro-less version 2. So Jenga has some of the original uh, distro-less developers from Google, and they really rethink their distro -less design and build Wolfi in mind for building a small, secure Linux environment, let's call it like this, which does not include any um, yeah, Linux distro, which does not include a kernel and tooling around it. So it's really stripped down to run or securely run containerized workloads. This is basically the main goal for Wolfi OS and the Wolfi images. Um, Beside this, there's a really nice ecosystem around, which really helps to, to build um, and, and securely build your images. So first of all, they have packages. They are based on APK, as you know from Alpine, um, and are really designed to be independent. So they're providing you with packages, and you can really say, okay, for this use case, I need this package, and this package, and this package, and they do not include any further stuff just to be more uh, yeah, compatible or something. So really just get the things you need. Um, on the other hand, those are once again secured. You once again have um, yeah, SBOM of all of them, but I will talk about in this in just a second. Um, yeah. On the other hand, as I said, they provide tooling. Um, and with this tooling, you can f build your applications in a declarative um, and reproducible way. So think about your Dockerfile you're all using, I guess. So Dockerfile is basically millions of run commands chained together, um, so it's basically not really declarative. And they have built a tools which allow you to yeah, get rid of the Docker file and get a declarative YAML where you really can define in a declarative way what you would like to get in your final image. Um, and this is really nice and really helps when, when building images. Um, we will show um, at this in just a sec. Yeah, and overall, um, Wolfie provides um, software bill of materials, so SBOMB, when you're building those images. So not only the packages itself get SBOM by default, also every build they provide for base images or you building, you will get out of the box um, SBOM for everything. Um, so why is this important? Quickly talking about software bill of materials here. Um, it's basically the list of ingredients for your container image. So it really includes all software, all dependencies, the version, and also, very important, any kind of hierarchical multi-level dependency. So you're relying on a package, and this package relies on a package, and so on. Basically, you will get all those dependencies in your software bill of materials and can then use this as baseline to validate your applications, to scan your applications against any vulnerabilities and stuff like this. 
And basically, you don't need to think about this. You will get it out of the box when you just build um, an uh, Anwolfi um, image here, which is pretty pretty nice. So um, the main idea is to give you a, a um, quick overview and then showing you some, some parts and action. So we will do a, um, a demo where we basically just build an containerized application as a node, Docker file, and so on, and then trying to uh, switch the from uh, the base image to Wolfi, and then also use the tools um, Wolfi provides in the ecosystem to build the image, and yeah, then showing you some of the um, the difference here. Okay. So I hope you can see all it. Um, so first of all, uh, starting on the left side. Um, basically, we have a small um, Node.js application. It's basically just a little bit of hello world here. Um, doesn't matter, just the easy one. Um, and we also have a Docker file here. So, which is basically a base image as Node, latest, doesn't matter. We have a working gear, we have an environment variables, we're coping over some stuff, doing an npm install. So, pretty simple. Um, so, first of all, let's um, build that um, quickly here. Okay, perfect. <laughs> okay, here we go. Make it a little bit bigger. Um, so I'm not using Docker here. Um, so I've container D installed, which is not CLI. It's just the CLI for um, for container D. So it's basically the same like Docker. So if you're not f uh, using NerdCTL, just think about Docker build. It's it's the exactly the same thing. So we're building the image here, as you know it. Hopefully, the things should be cached and should be pretty fast. Yeah, and then just um, yeah, quickly running it here um, to show it you, and then doing just a curl on localhost 8080, and yeah, we're getting the hello world. So not not really really fancy here. Okay. So nothing new so far. Um, if you now would like to check for any vulnerabilities and dependencies included, um, there is basically multiple options. In our case, we could now go for um, a tooling from uh, called Sift, which basically analyzes your container image and provides you with a software bill of material. Um, so for this, I just export, uh, exported the, the container image here to a local tar, and now I can do, sorry, <laughs> Now can do a um, surf package um, telling um, yeah which scope to use basically all layers because I would like also to get sub dependence and stuff like this and then doing an output here um, to a local file um, yeah and this is basically the OCI image I would like to um, to scan and now basically now sift goes over and passes the image gets all the dependencies and writes them down in a big um, JSON file. So basically, if we do a quick look here at the SBOM JSON over here, and this is basically now a long, long list of all of our dependencies in this container. Um, so it's, it's good to have, but now you, of course, would like to know, OK, what versions are here? Do we have any security issues, vulnerabilities available, and so on? And there's a different tool. Uh, it's called Cripe which you now can use and say, hey, here's my SBOM. And then Gripe goes over this SBOM, also has a catalog in place, and then analyzes, okay, is there any vulnerability for a specific version we're using? And now we're seeing here we just a, a Hello World application. Nothing special on a normal node image everyone would use here. This is the list of CVEs we have in this image. And it's pretty long. It depends on the time when I'm doing the talk because I'm using latest, but this is basically the current available version, and we have a long, long list of CVEs here, um, which you could could fix. Um, so not really secure, to be honest. So let's see if we can improve that one. Um, and we're starting with with Wolfie, and just using Wolfie as a base image. So if we now go um, to this Docker file here, everything is pretty the same. Um, the only difference is that we here do use a different base image. This is basically 
um, Jenga providing us with some kind of base images which they hardened and built up um, to use for us as, as a base. And this is basically the latest node base um, we could, could use now. Um, and basically, it's still the same. Um, so next one would be, once again, just a Docker build um, with this different Docker file, with the same application. And um, yeah, basically, everything will, will stay the same. It's way faster to build it, <laughs> first of all. And now run it again to show you that it's still working. Doing um, the curl again. And one again, we have here the Hello World. So the application is still, still working. So um, now we could, of course, once again, use Sift and, and Cribe to build um, SBOM and so on. But this isn't needed, um, at least in this scenario where we use the base image. Um, we can just grab um, this SBOM and download it. This is this part we will do here to get an SBOM for at least um, the base image. Of course, we have the application in here, but basically most of the CVEs we just saw are based uh, a CVE based on the on the US, not the Node application on top. Um, so yeah, this is not totally fine here because it's um, just the SBOM from the base image. But just to show you, um, basically we are just downloading that one here locally. No, we, we have it here. This is basically the SBOM provided by, by Chengard for the image. Um, and now we can use Scribe to go over that one. On the list is basically empty. So we have no vulnerabilities found in that image versus the, I don't know, 200 vulnerabilities from the normal node image. So the only thing we did is just changing out the base image so far, nothing more. And of course, this does not include the um, node uh, application itself, but basically there wasn't many here because there are many dependencies. Also, of course, but I think this is pretty clear, um, there isn't much stuff going on in the images because they are so, so secure, there are no dependencies in it. Um, but also, if we check here for the size, we have um, in the origin 250 megabytes and in the Wolfie version just 38. Um, so, of course, it's smaller, faster, and so on, um, because of the less dependencies. So, but still, um, this is just the base image. So, as I said, there is tooling around, like uh, Melange and Epico, which we can use to also build images with Wolfy without um, yeah, the Docker file. So, first of all, we have, we have Melange, and basically Melange defines how to build our application. So with Relosh, we're building an APK package. And later, with APCO, we're building a container image or CI image based on different packages. So first up is really building the package here. Um, so we're defining a name, we're defining an environment. So this is basically what we need to build our uh, package. So basically, the from base image so we have here some um, busy box, we have Node.js, we have some, some Wolfie base layout, um, certificates and stuff like this, just the plain stuff. And then basically we have uh, some pipeline, pipeline step here. And it could be just copying a binary somewhere. Uh, in my case, it's basically uh, doing an NPM install um, and then um, yeah, copying, pasting specific files in a target destination directory where basically the stuff ends after installing this package. Um, this is basically all to build up this package. So first thing we are doing here, um, we have in a command just to get some, some keys here generated. Um, what is happening here? Basically, all the tools um, will be provided in an SDK image. So basically, you're just running an SDK. Um, from Wolfie, and there do you have all the binaries and can just uh, swap up the endpoint and say, okay, now I would like to, to use Melage um, and um, yeah, get an, a key again here. So basically, the main idea is just to get some keys um, to sign the stuff. And we are not talking about the image, we're really talking about the package here at the moment. And then the next command is once again um, rerunning that stuff, mounting our source code, sa saying, hey, we would like to use Melage here. Um, in the latest version and build 
this package on AMD on my machine here, um, providing the keyring, providing the configuration, and then is basically everything we need. And if we now run this, basically uh, Melage will go ahead and build our application and uh, combines it at a, at a package and, and stores on our local machine. And it takes some time. So should be finished pretty soon, hopefully. Okay, here we go. Um, and now it's basically, um, yeah, building up all the stuff and building the final package shouldn't take pretty long. And as an outcome, um, we get our package um, folder here, our environment, and then basically we're getting our APK file here, which contains our Hello World node application. And this is basically now the baseline to build our image. So next step would be to get to the um, APCO um, YAML. And this really defines our final image. So we once again say, okay, we would like to get the Wolf OS as a repository, we would like to get our local uh, package folder as a repository, and then we're just installing some things. So for example, we would like to get, once again, Busybox, we would like to get Node.js, um, and for example, here, our local Hello app. So basically, this package over here being installed. And then um, we're defining some further information, basically a parse, which basically means a run mkdir, um, our work here, some permissions here, environment variables, um, our entry point, CMD, and saying, hey, we would like to get a node user with um, this dependencies. So as you see, it's really declarative. We are not having a long wrong command, creating a user, changing permissions, and, and stuff like this, which is, was, which is pretty nice. Um, yeah, and if we now um, basically um, run the last command here, which is Overall the same, just we're using AP Core here. Um, and we once again say, would like to have this build. We're providing once again the key, um, the YAML, and then basically um, the image name and the tag we would um, like to use. And then where to export it. You could also um, directly push it in a container registry, but in our case, um, running it locally um, is fine. Okay, and now basically we'll get the image built um, and um, yeah, basically stored here on our local machine, and which we now also get because um, the whole Wolfie ecosystem thinks about SBOM. We will now get an SBOM from our image with our application in it. So once again, we have an SBOM for everything and we can then check again, for example, all the dependencies. So this is basically, it's not yet ready, but basically these are my old files when I tested it. So we have here the whole um, SBOM, including of all dependencies on the one and can then go ahead and use that one to validate. And this then once again includes our application. Yeah, and basically here's the output or CI image of our Hello World application. So of course we could once again run this one here, but I would skip that one because I talked too much already. Um, <laughs> but trust me, it will work. <laughs> okay, good. So this was Wolfie, really just a small introduction. Um, I really like the tool, um, it, it is pretty new. Um, so there are some issues you need to work around the documentation isn't the best one, but I really like it, um, how it works and, and how it could, could help or can help to build secure um, containers. Um, yeah, next one um, is image verification. So think about you're running um, an image and you would like to make sure that this is the image you have built or uh, a third party built it um, where, you, where you trust it as a party. Um, and this is basically where a tool um, comes in, which is called the cosine. Um, and cosine helps you basically to sign anything OCI related. So it could be containers, but container image could be anything. Um, 
Yeah, and if you combine that one together with some Kubernetes policy management, for example, Kaiwerno or for example, Open Policy Agent, you can then make sure that your Kubernetes cluster only runs container images which are validated. So signed images, we are then basically the Kubernetes cluster will validate if everything is fine, if this is the image you would like to have and then start to run it. Um, so basically, if anyone injects any kind of other image, basically then the Kubernetes policy agent or Kaivana would say, uh-uh, this application, is not, uh, this image is not trusted and wouldn't start it. So, so really uh, important, not only for third party applications, also if you have a bigger company or enterprise company and somebody just builds containers and the other one is running it, or just to really make sure that um, in your CACD, you are really then running the stuff you have built five seconds ago, um, you need to uh, basically sign um, yeah, your artifacts and then also validate it. So this is basically done with, with Cosign. Um, if you would like to learn more on Cosign and Sixstone in general, um, there's basically now going on a session from Erkan. He is talking 45 minutes just about this one. Uh, so maybe you can uh, have a look on that afterwards or listen to, to the recording or anything. But just as a short intro, um, really Cosign helps you signing and with integration of Open Policy Agent or um, Kaverna, you can then validate it in your cluster. So what we will do here, um, first of all, we will deploy a demo. Um, a, a demo, uh, a policy, sorry, <laughs> um, to define what we would like to get, so which images we trust and so on. Um, and then we will also sign our own image, that one we just built and run it in our cluster. Um, there are multiple ways. Um, so we're doing two ways. First of all, we're running a base image from a Wolfie, what we just saw, and those are already signed. So we can just validate if this image is signed, and they are doing it with a feature in Sixto, which is keyless signing. So basically, um, they're signing it with a really short living key or certificate, and then basically those certificates will be stored um, in a transparency log, where then basically later when you run the workload can validate if this basically uh, merged together. So basically the developer on the left side authenticates with OpenID Connect, gets a certificate, short lived certificates, signing the artifacts, stores the artifacts somewhere and publishes the signing certificate in the transparency log on the right here. And this transparency log is could be your self-hosted one, but if you use that one from Jenga, it's a public one, and basically everyone then running um, somewhere in the world can validate against this transparency log when starting the container image or container incident and make sure that basically um, those are matching here. And this is basically what, we'll, what we will do in, a, in the first scenario here. Um, if we go over to the cosine directory, So, um, so first of all, um, we're starting with getting the Kubernetes ready. So um, we have a policy. Um, this, this one here, um, which basically is um, a keyless signing policy. That was what I just um, defined. So we have some, we're doing it with Camerno here. You're saying, hey, it's kind of policy. Uh, we're doing some uh, specs here, but the important stuff is that one. So we have a rule, and this rule says any resources from kind pod needs to be verified. And they need to be verified if the image um, contains um, the chain guard container registry. So basically every image from this container registry needs to be verified. And how is basically the part here. So we're thinking, hey, we'd like to get a keyless um, validation. We need to provide a subject, an issuer, and an URL. So this is basically the transparency log here. And with this, basically, Kaiverno goes to the transparency log and validates um, the image before um, the pod is started. So, and if we now, oh my god. So um, if we now apply this one, 
into our cluster, just kubectl apply. We're basically telling our Kubernetes cluster to, to do so um, and to really validate it. So if we now run an application, and in this case, it's just the Nginx from Changard. So once again, they have built a base image based on Nginx. Um, name it Nginx minus some, some random stuff here. We're starting it using, it takes some seconds. Some more seconds. <laughs> Should be faster. Okay, but what now happens in the background, um, the cluster is validating um, and then says, okay, the pod is created. Um, if you now go to the, um, to the event section and search for the events, we're seeing, okay, the container is created, the container is uh, started, it's successfully pulled, pulling image, um, assigning, and this one is the important thing we're getting a, a policy applied. We're seeing it's our check if image assigned keyless policy, and the message is um, that our pod has passed that one. Um, so now we are really make sure that the instance we're running, the pod we're running, is based on the signed version from, um, from ChainGuard. Otherwise, now we would get an error and the pod wouldn't be scheduled. So, but how does this work with our own um, application? So um, we will do the same just with the application we just have built with uh, Meloge, Apico, uh, and so on. So basically the image we just have built. So first of all, I'm loading it into our, my um, container D here and then pushing it into my um, GitHub repo. So just create a GitHub repo and pushing it into the artifacts here. And we are done. And then I'm using cosine and saying, hey, cosine, please create me um, uh, a key pair here. Doing that one, then we need a password and a password again. And yes, we would like to override it because it was locally. So we're getting here our cosine key and our cosine um, public key. And with this, we now can do a cosine sign, providing the uh, cosine key. And then we need to get um, the hash and it's basically here just a script that it works, but basically you can just put it in here. Um, once again, entering our password for the private key. And what now happens is cosine, yes, cosine is signing our uh, container image and directly pushing this signature next to our container image in our container registry. So it's now living um, next to our container image in our container registry on GitHub. So, and if we now define a policy um, and say, okay, once again, we have the same rule kind pod. We would like to validate everything which is in container registry on GitHub um, under uh, Nico Meisenzahl um, and then saying, okay, validate that the public key is a specific one. So. This one wouldn't work because this one is out. So going to the cosine um, pub here, we just created and editing this policy here with our public key, saving it, and then applying this one also in our cluster. And once again, now running the application we have built, so our hello world. And the pod is created. And the container is creating. So once again, now you have the proof that the application is running. <laughs> we have just built. Uh, and when we once again go here for kubectl get events, like we did in our previous example, uh, we once again see here our policy applied, check if image assigned, and it's parsed. So if we now would put it in uh, the, the old public key or anything else, um, basically, once again, Kubernetes would have said, okay, no, it doesn't work. Um, the public key doesn't match, um, and I wouldn't start that one here. And once again, of course, you could also use the serverless, uh, the keyless signing here, um, but just wanted to, to show you the, the different options you have. Okay, um, last but not least, um, 
we still have our container runtime security. So if you have anything running in your cluster and you would like to make sure and validate that nobody injected into your cluster, injected into workload and so on, uh, you could basically use Tetragon, for example. So Tetragon relies on EPBF um, and helps you or give you awareness what is running in your cluster. So with Tetragon, you know when there is a shell or anything executed in within your pod. So you have the awareness, you can trigger an alert, you can, for example, um, kill the process and so on. So we really have um, yeah, real-time enforcement into your cluster. Um, as I said, it's based on EPPF, so short intro on EPPF, also a topic you could talk eight hours. But basically, EPPF helps you to build cloud native or any cloud native way, networking, security, observability, and tracing into your Kubernetes stack. It's not just about Kubernetes, so basically, EPPF is pretty old, um, pretty long time in the, uh, in the Kubernetes uh, or in the Linux world. What it does, it allows third party tools or your own applications, if you like to to run sandbox code in the kernel. So basically, with EPPF, you can run code uh, triggered on specific events in the kernel. So if any application talks from the user space with the system space and say, hey, I would like to open a file, you could put this as a, as a trigger and then do something in your EPPF code. Um, and this is basically how all the toolings rely on. So with EPPF and, and Tetragon, we have basically a daemon running on our node, which acts on specific events and then doing alerting us, killing the process and so on. So it's not a sidecar injected in a workload or something, it really relies on the kernel of the node and then helps you with networking, with security and observability and stuff like this. This is basically in, in just some sentence what what's EPF does. So on this EPPF and Tetragon, we can now basically um, yeah, see if our workload is injected. So what we'll do, um, I have a running instance of a Java application which is not fixed um, for log4shell. Log so we will try to get into the pod um, via log4shell, executing commands in the pod, and then afterwards trying um, to implement a policy to deny those kind of requests. Um, shortly about um, log4shell, um, so basically, log4shell allows you uh, to inject a GNDI string, and we will see one in a sec, um, and telling your application, hey, please talk to an LDAP server. Um, then the application will talk to the LDAP server, and the LDAP server will say, hey, application, here is a Java class, please execute it. Um, and this Java class is something we provide via a, um, a HTTP server, and this Java class basically say, okay, spin up a shell on the pod and expose it. And then basically we have a bash or a shell open on the pod and can execute any commands. And this is what we will do now and then we will try to block it. So, um, let me get rid of all the stuff here. Um, Theodragon, so, um, now it's getting a little bit complex, but I hope it's fine. So to do though, so, we need um, first of all an LDAP server and the web server we can then talk to. And this is basically just um, yeah, deployed on a virtual machine with a public endpoint because it's a reverse shell, so basically the pod needs to connect somewhere. And now we have a um, Ubuntu machine here which hosting the code which we now use. Um, basically, the code is not of mine. I documented it on the repo. Um, it's basically just a, a POC for log4shell. But what we'll do, first of all, we are starting a Python application, um, providing us with the LDAP server we need to talk to, and also the web server providing the Java class. This is the first step, so it's now running. On the other hand, we also need to open up a port because we need to connect somewhere. So it's a reverse shell, so we need an open port to connect to. And this is basically just port listen on this machine on um, yeah, 443, doesn't matter. Um, so so now we have an open connection and it's just, just listening. So now we have a web application here um, with a login screen here. So now we're using the GNDI string, this, this one here, which basically say, hey, talk via LDAP with my um, virtual machine on the LDAP port. Um, putting this in here, 
and let's go for the password blah and logging in. So it's loading, it's loading, it's loading, nothing has happened. But if I now go back, I have a connection received. Now let's list the directory. This is not the local directory from my virtual machine. This is the local directory from the pod running in our Kubernetes cluster. So we are now having a shell open in our Kubernetes cluster. And basically, this is the stuff I'm doing in the hijack talk. And now we could start spinning up virtual machine, talking to the Kubernetes API, mining some Bitcoins, and so on. Um, so basically, you can go, this is running on Azure, you can really go in a bad case, getting the credentials or the instant the Kubernetes cluster is running on and using those credentials to spin up any other workload on Azure. Um, so this is really bad, but we will leave it here for now. So we are in the pod, which is bad. So how could we um, fix that one? Um, basically with Tetragon. So what we will do, and this is a pretty easy policy, um, we're saying if there is a process which isn't or doesn't have the process ID one, kill it. So basically, you should only run one process in your container. Of course, we could make this a little bit better, but for demo purposes, just if it's not pit one, kill it. Um, so this is basically what we now deploy into our cluster. Um, sorry. Now. Uh, eh. Okay, so we have the policy in place for Tetragon. So, and now, best case, we are um, going back to the virtual machine here. So we are back on the virtual machine. It's still the LDAP server and the HTTP server um, is still running. So we just need again the open port here. Uh, here we got a timeout. So we're going back to the application here. Uh, sorry, I need to grab the GNDI string again. Uh, putting it here. Once again, for go for password blah. It doesn't matter, it could also be blah blah. Executing it again. And now it's not loading, but we're getting a password you entered as wasn't valid, blah blah blah. If you're now going to machine here, we got a connection received, but LS doesn't work. So we had an short time where the connection was up, the shell was started, but then Tetragon saw it, that there's a shell, a process started, and directly killed it. So it didn't kill the pod, just the second process in the pod. And if we now go um, and check the logs here, um, and this is pretty, pretty nice. Um, so basically you just rely on the Kubernetes logs, of, of Tetragon and then they uh, developed a t so called Tetra CLI where you can get the events um, yeah, in, in a nicer output here. Um, 